few years ago, I read a book by former President George W. Bush. It's entitled in Decision Points. And there was a passage, a story in that book that grabbed my interest. He talks about his father, another former president, of course, George H.W. Bush, and a meeting that he had in summer of 1985 with the famous evangelist Billy Graham. He had invited Graham to their home in Maine for dinner, and afterward the family sat around and talked for a while with Graham, actually got to ask him a series of questions. The first question came from the 41st president, it was this. He said, Billy, some people say you have to have a born-again experience to go to heaven. My mother here is the most religious, kind person I know, yet she has had no born-again experience. Will she go to heaven? Now, can you imagine the pressure on on Graham as to what to say in that moment? It had to be pretty intense. Uh, he's, he's talking to one of the most powerful men in the world in his home, in front of his mother that he just asked about, and in the midst of one of the most influential families in the history of the United States surrounding him, the Bushes. And so as a preacher, I don't envy Graham in that moment. Uh, however, the pressure doesn't excuse the answer that was given by a man who really had to know better. Graham's answer was as follows. He said, George, some of us require a born-again experience to understand God, and some of us are just born Christians. It sounds as if your mom was just born a Christian. just list all the things wrong with that statement and it's sad that a man who had stood before probably more people than any other in the last century with the Bible in his hand could be so confused about the truth the truth is there's no such thing as a person who is born a Christian one may be born to Christian parents one may be born in what's called a Christian nation, but no one is born a Christian. And then the truth also is that this term born again Christian is really sort of redundant when you think about it. A Christian by definition has been born again. Uh, just like Jesus said needed to happen. John chapter three, you remember he had this discussion with Nicodemus. He said, you must be born again of water and spirit. And so a person who has been born again, spiritually speaking, is a Christian. So I want to be re all of us to be reminded this morning a bit of how one becomes a Christian in the first place. And to do so, I want us to re remember one of the great personalities of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. But before he became who we know as the Apostle Paul, who is the great writer of the New Testament, uh, the great first century missionary, the great evangelist. He was one of the great, before, all that, all, before he became all that, he, he was one of the great persecutors of Christians and probably the greatest enemy that the earliest church had. In fact, he was a personal enemy of Jesus himself. Paul, of course then Saul, was born a Jew. He was well educated. He was very religious. He prayed. He devoted himself to the law. He became a leader among his group of Jews, a, a leading Pharisee. They were sort of the religious heroes of the first century. They were really the back to the Bible restoration movement among the Jews in the first century. And so Paul was very passionate about what he believed. 
he was zealous for the law of God. And so he was sort of on the road to stardom among the Jews of the first century. He was also lost in his sin, as all people without Christ are. He could be the most deeply religious person in the world at the time, but he was awash in his sins, with no hope for eternity, without God. And really, if Jesus had returned in those early years to judge the world, Saul would have lost his soul. He would have spent eternity in a place that wasn't designed for him, but was designed for the devil and his angels. Saul was lost, as lost as he could be. I think there are a lot of things you can learn from that truth. One is that, that being religious does not mean that one is saved. Neither does reading and learning the Bible. Neither does being really, really passionate about what you believe. All those things are good things. Being religious, reading, learning the Bible, being passionate about your beliefs, they're good. But they're not saving things. Saul was not saved at this point. One day, Saul had what anybody would acknowledge was a great, powerful, religious experience. One very, very few have ever had, in fact. It was that he saw with his own eyes the risen Jesus. Jesus appeared to him in a blinding vision as Saul was traveling to Syria, to the great city of Syria, Damascus. The story is recorded in Acts chapter 9, among other places. And Jesus, in this vision, speaks to Saul, and Saul speaks to Jesus. Jesus says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul asks, who are you? And Jesus tells him. Saul is led away from that experience blind and absolutely traumatized. For three days, he remains in that condition, so bad that he, he neither eats nor drinks during all that time. Now, would you agree that that was an experience? That it was a religious experience? I'll say. Would you, would you say that that was a spiritual experience that Saul had, talking to the risen Lord? Certainly. Do you think that it was a life-changing experience, a life-changing religious experience? I don't know how else to understand it. He was blinded. He is in to a sudden, total fast, no food, no water, three days. Folks, that will kill you if you're not careful. Let me ask you to consider one more. Do you think Saul was a believer in Jesus after he saw Jesus? A man that he knew very well had been crucified and had been buried in a tomb outside Jerusalem. And he sees this man alive and well and speaking to him. Do you think that Saul now believed in Jesus? I don't know how he could. So in summary, Saul was religious. He was a Bible believer. Indeed, he no doubt had the Bible that was there at that time memorized. He was zealous, he was passionate, and then he had a religious experience beyond all others, and he was a believer in Jesus. But I'll tell you the truth this morning, that when we pick up the story in Acts chapter 22, Saul is he's sitting in darkness up in Damascus, he's hungry, he's thirsty, I tell you, he's still lost. Just as lost 
as he was ever before. So God sends this evangelist to this lost man, Saul, the man's name that God sent was Ananias. And this is what we read happening, Acts chapter 22, verse 12. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me, this is Paul speaking, and standing by me, he said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. It's an amazing encounter between these two. But did you notice in this that Saul has even more religious experience? He, uh, he's the recipient of a miracle of healing. His sight is restored by a word from Ananias. He's affirmed by Ananias in several things. Did you notice that? He says God had appointed Saul to know his will, but he's still a lost man. Ananias said that Saul had been appointed to see the righteous one, that is Jesus, and to hear his voice. But the truth is, even after that, Saul is still lost. And perhaps even more incredibly, God had already planned out, mapped out the rest of Saul's life. He had a plan, a very important plan for the rest of Saul's days. But the truth is, still, Saul was not yet saved. Why do I say that? How do we know that? Just by the words we read. Verse 16, Ananias says to Saul, and now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Saul was still in his sins. And so Saul, you see, remains lost. Sin separates us from God. He was dead in sin. He was unredeemed. He was without hope. He was without God. There was an urgency in what Ananias said. He's speaking to a real believer in Jesus, Saul of Tarsus. Saul believes in Jesus. And he needed to do what all believers must do. He needed to be saved. He needed to wash his sins away. He needed to obey Jesus, to obey the gospel of Jesus. He needed to be baptized into Christ. He needed to be born again of water and the Spirit, like Jesus said. And he was. Right away. He rose up. He was baptized. You can read about this in the other account of this story in Acts chapter 9. This man who had, who had had so much experience this man who had read his Bible, knew it by heart, who had worshipped God, who had prayed, this deeply religious man, this man who had seen the risen Lord, this man who had heard the voice of the Son of God, this lost man needed to be saved. And he was. One of the saddest things I can tell you this morning is that you could listen to a hundred different preachers today in a hundred different churches and you might not hear another one of them tell you what I just told you. Doesn't mean that I'm smarter than them. 
doesn't mean that I'm more spiritual than them. Or anything like that. Satan knows what saves people. And so he has set out to blind as many people as he can from the truth of salvation in Christ. And many remain blinded. Many have yet to take that important step that Saul took. Many have yet to rise up and, and be baptized and wash away their sins, calling on the name of the Lord. There might be people here today who have yet to do that. Good people, righteous people, religious people, people whom God has a plan for, but still lost people. Why do you wait? Why do you wait? Arise and be baptized today. That invitation is always open. 24-7, 365. And if you need to respond to it, we're ready to help you. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you for the day, for making it possible for us to come together, even though we're in these circumstances in our world right now. Thank you for your word and the truth that is there. Help us to understand it, and most importantly, to live it out. Thank you for Jesus, Savior, and what he offers us, relationship and eternity with you. Help us to honor him in our walk. We pray in his name. Amen. final song before the closing prayer will be when we all get to heaven and I know it's warm out but after the closing prayer can everybody please stay seated so when we all get to heaven sing the wondrous love of Jesus sing his mercy and his grace in the mansions bright and blessed he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, us, we'll sing and shout the victory. Well, good morning again, everybody. It's really good to see everyone. Uh, trust me, it is. Um, there are so many churches that are unable to meet this all virtual until maybe next year. So we are blessed by, by far. Uh, just, um, you know, we be patient with us <laughs> as leaders. We have, we meet weekly. We tweak this weekly. Uh, this is not fun. Um, so bear with us and uh, hopefully we can get through this okay uh, pray that we will um, just uh, 
So just be praying for us that we do what's right and we want the safety, of course, of all of you. And again, we love you all so much. We don't want any harm to come to you. Um, so another thing is, I know it's hot. Could I see if maybe raise of hand? I know we talked about this a little bit in the meeting. Maybe meeting another half hour earlier. <laughs> I mean, I know it's hard with people with littles, but maybe if we met at nine. Okay. Okay. Because in next week it looks like it's going to be 90s also. So maybe, maybe like I said, we're tweaking this every week. So just bear with us, and maybe we can be done before we melt, and we have to have a big spatula come in and turn us over. So okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and just, again, thankful. And we were so blessed by being able to be together in this capacity. And we just pray. We pray so much for wisdom, for strength. And, of course, we pray for our community, our families, and our nation. We need you so much. Help us to be alive. Uh, just, we, just, uh, we just ask your blessings on us. And uh, throughout this day and throughout this week, in Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if everybody received